started precisely at 1025. You know, it's either 1026 or 7. So I think I'm in good shape. It's 1027 and a half this morning. Oh, we don't start until the ringing of the bell, do we? I was previous. I'm going to ask you about your joys this week. So think about that. Carolyn Reynolds is back with us. Uh, okay, Carolyn. Karen Yuga is still pretty sick, I understand. But we're delighted that you're here. I'm wondering if you have any joys this morning. You know, we always come up with concerns during our time of praying. Uh, do you have joys this morning you'd like to remember? Positive things. Yes, sir. God, two joys, two joys. Brian? You're getting organized. Whoa, that's claiming a lot. I'm not sure that Debbie goes along with that organized business. Other joys. I'm just thankful for just time for fellowship. Okay. Did you hear her, Rhonda? She's thankful for fellowship and community. Okay, other joys. Debbie. I'm thankful that this church is so warm and friendly and is welcoming and is part of the family here at this church. And as much as I love the church I have been to, and Brian and I'll be going there next week because um, they want to meet Brian just as you guys wanted to meet me. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm grateful for so many people who are warm and loving and inviting me to, to share in worship, to share in the love of Jesus Christ. And you can't find anybody friendlier than the people here, and I thank you all for that. Amen, amen. All right, give yourself up, oh, Peggy. Oh, she saved the best for last. I think this is the time to greet each other, right? Sure. Okay. Sure. Oh. As forgiven people, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. May the peace of Christ be with you all. And also with you. Greet one another uh, in whatever way feels best to you. Peace. Peace. Glad you all are back. I checked in, no concern. <laughs> Oops. Whoa! Glad you found. That's a, a double piece. Double. Very good. Hello, everybody. Hi, Betty. Hi, Karen. Hi, Carolyn. Y'all won't believe this, but I still have some announcements. Thanks for enabling Patty and I to go off. It was a joy to see our friends in Chicago and to greet our younger son and his wife in Madison. I want to welcome people who are not yet members of Palmetto Presbyterian to membership. See me if you are not a member and you want to become a member. Uh, delighted to have you. Welcome to our Zoomers. We're happy you're here. 
to worship God. Our session meeting uh, will be on Tuesday from 5.30 to 7. Are we Zooming, Barbara? Probably could so that others can join, Steve and Hazel. Good. And Jeff. And I, and, oh, well, Jeff, yeah, maybe. <laughs> excellent, excellent, I'll excellent. I'll send it out later. If you have concerns or you want to raise concerns, <laughs> you see Dale, Don, Barbara, I think that's all who are here this morning. Okay. Um, the thrift store will be open on Saturdays as an experiment during the month of August from 10 to 2. We thought about it and we realized that people who work are, are working from 1 to 3 on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. So we'll try that. Well, I've, I'm started on these announcements. I better keep going. Uh, we had a pastor's meeting uh, in connection with the vital congregations. And I told them what this church was doing. And I was really proud of you. You know, I thought, you know, there are a lot of big churches, but they're not doing as much as we are. So, congratulate yourselves. And now, let us turn to God and worship. We know that we are not perfect, that we sin, and we also know that we have a heavenly parent who is ready to forgive us our sins. Let us confess together. We do not understand our own actions, for we do not do what we want, but we do the very things we hate. Now, if we do what we do not want, we agree that your law guides us. 
But in fact, it is no longer we that do them, but sin dwells within us. We know that you are able to bring a rebirth in us. By the power of the Holy Spirit, work this rebirth in us, creating in our hearts the confidence of chosen one. With assured faith in your promise revealed to us by your word, by this faith, we grasp Jesus Christ with the grace and blessings promised in him. Forgive our sins and help us to worship you and to love each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. We know that God stands ever ready to forgive us our sin and renew a right spirit within us. I declare to you that through the work of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. And we affirm our identity in Christ using part of the Declaration of Faith, chapter one. God's reality far exceeds all our words can say. The Lord's requirements are not always what we think are best. The Lord's care for us is not always what we want. God comes to us on his own terms and is able to do far more than we ask or think. God makes himself known in Jesus Christ. Jesus' involvement in the human condition is God's involvement. His compassion for all kinds of people is God's compassion. His demand for justice, truth, and faithfulness is God's demand. His willingness to suffer rejection is God's willingness. God's love for the very people who reject him is God's love. We must not set our ultimate reliance on any other help. We must not yield unconditional obedience to any other power. We must not love anyone or anything more than we love God. To worship God is highest joy. To serve God is perfect freedom. Amen. Our hymn of celebration is number 158, I Sing the Mighty Power of God. Please stand as you are able.
seated. Do not be afraid, little flock. What? You know, it's been a long time since we heard something like that. Rather, more frequently, we are advised to be afraid. Not just careful or reasonably cautious, but anxious and afraid. I don't know about you, but we watch uh, CBS News and sometimes we just can't take it anymore. How truly vulnerable are we when someone rings our doorbell? Or COVID, while it's reasonable to be careful, it does add a bit to the climate of fear. And it feels like mall and concert shootings and school shootings have become routine. As a matter of fact, it's hard to remember where they all took place. Nearly all the nightly news talks about violence or climate change or a recession. So it's hard to find a Netflix or Amazon movie that doesn't promote feelings of anxiety. Crime is in. Be very afraid. Then go out and buy stuff. A security system of some kind. Medicines. I think you have to be at least 65 to watch the CBS News. We get medicine after medicine after medicine commercial. It's just incredible. Ah, maybe we'll have to change the channel, but I suspect that other channels do the same thing. Compare these signs of fearful times with our scripture today, which comes to us from the Gospel of Luke, the 12th chapter, the 32nd through the 40th verse. This is the word of God. Do not be afraid, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give alms. Make purses for yourselves that do not wear out. An unfailing treasure in heaven where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Be dressed for action and have your lamps lit. Be like those who are waiting for their master return from the wedding banquet, so they may open the door for him as soon as he comes and knocks. Blessed are those slaves whom the master finds alert when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will fasten his belt and have them sit down to eat, and he will come and serve them. If he comes during the middle of the night or near dawn and finds them so, blessed are those slaves. But know this, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. The word of the Lord be to God. Amen. A couple of Sundays ago, we were thinking about prayer. Not the easiest sermon I've ever preached. But I want to come back to two points that lay a foundation for today's sermon. And the two are pretty simple. Number one, trust God. Number two, trust each other. 
So one was the fact that when we pray, we often do not receive what we prayed for, at least what we think we wanted. We have to trust that God has the best in mind for us. So prayer is not a matter of getting what we want, but accepting with humility, if we can't muster gratitude at the moment, what we get. We need to enjoy the day the Lord has given us. So this is finally a matter of trusting God, letting God know what we want. It's not a matter of letting God know what we want as though he were cosmic Santa Claus who sort of delivers whatever we want. Can we trust God? And if not God, who? Beyond our thoughts about who God is, beyond our images of God, beyond even our imaginations, beyond what we want, beyond our projections of what makes sense. Can we do that? Can, can we really know what's best for us? I bet you've had times when you prayed for something, it hadn't happened, but in retrospect, you say, thank God that didn't happen. I didn't get what I wanted, what I thought was so good. I remember thanking God or asking God after a job interview that I got get that job. Well, looking back at it, that would have been a disaster to have worked at that college. So maybe one test of trusting God is simply learning to accept difficult situations with a calm sense that God is present there even if we don't see God's hand. Second, trusting each other. So as we learn to trust God to give us good gifts, we can learn to trust each other in appropriate ways. And I, I think I mean each other in the church. Other places, maybe. And I'm talking specifically about you and you and you and even the choir, you know? So as we trust God, we learn to trust each other. So if we want to be different from the world of fear and protecting ourselves, then we learn to trust to be open to each other. So Many people have said, Jesus came to create a community of disciples. That is us. So often, I want to be right rather than be kind, to have my way rather than the community's decision. And so I pray God, and I ask that you also pray to learn to trust one another. So who should we trust? Where should we invest our treasure? What community do you belong to? Those are the questions that will frame this sermon. Jesus begins our passage today by telling his disciples, do not be afraid. Why? Because it is God's good pleasure God wants to give you the kingdom. So the passage that it comes before this is about the birds of the air and what are you going to be clothed with? And the final verse of that says, don't worry about that. God will give you whatever you need. You don't need to be covetous. You don't need to try to keep up with the Joneses to try to get all the slick things that they have. 
He warned against anxiety about what to wear or what to eat. So today's text connects our attitude about possessions in particular with unhealthy, unfaithful anxiety. So that's not a healthy form of concern. What is a healthy form of concern for the material welfare of others and of ourselves, but a driving preoccupation to get more and more and more. Boy, is it easy to let that sneak into ourselves today. There are a lot of cultural media that tell us more is better. Uh, they did a study of a couple of years ago, and they asked people what, what it would take for them to be really happy. And regardless of their income level, people said that to be really happy would take about $20,000 more. Whether they were rich or poor, they, they settled on $20,000. So nobody really felt like they had enough. Few in our culture experience life as abundant and rich with blessings. In this morning's passage, Jesus said we should not be improperly afraid because God has already given us the kingdom, has already given us the kingdom. This is good news, right? But it's a tricky saying, God has given us the kingdom. Being obsessively anxious about material things ultimately reflects a lot of lack of trust in God. And often it can foster a failure of generosity to others. A lot of that uh, obsessiveness about getting things, I think, is born of fear. You know, the, mess the cultural message is that if you get enough, your fear will vanish. But we've all tried that out, and it really doesn't work, does it? What can deliver us from fear? Jesus has an answer for that, and I'm going to hold off giving you the answer for a minute. Let me tell you about how monetary treasure can infect relationships. We have some young acquaintances who got married. We'll call them Jim and Jane. They're a lovely young professional couple. Jane's family is enormously wealthy. They're one of the top beef producers in the state of Texas. So you can imagine. Jim's well off too, but certainly not in her league. They got married, and Jane got, had two jobs that she walked away from. She'd never learned to work through difficult situations or with difficult people or to stay the course when the going got tough at work or in her friendships. She didn't need to worry about the consequences of quitting her job. Her family's money provided a golden cushion for her to fall into, and uh, it drew to her new friends. I use that word advisedly. Not surprisingly, Jane, before long, told Jim that she wanted a divorce. She said he worked too hard. He was no longer fun. They weren't going traveling to fabulous places or having parties. To be fair, Jim may have focused too much on work. 
climbing his way into the lofty spheres that her family had. But to me, the negative impact of money in this situation is pretty evident. Hoarding is another expression of the way a focus on acquiring things can slide silently into a vicious, socially isolating habit. We have friends in town who are so ashamed of the state of their condo, stuffed to the gills, that they can't invite people over to visit or reciprocate. When it gets dangerously unhealthy, we've volunteered in the past to help them <laughs> clear out garbage, uh, but, you know, there's so much we barely make a dent in it. We all, to one degree or another, need to practice detachment to be able to let go, especially of material things. Sometimes, sometimes we even have to let go of people to detach ourselves from unhealthy relationships. What frees us from such fear? Trusting God does to some extent, but how to practice that? How to, how to strengthen that ability to detach? Jesus suggests that we sell our possessions and give alms. Hoo-hoo, you know? That just cuts so much against what the culture teaches us. So if we want to be freed from an obsession to get more and more, then we have to give some stuff away. Ho, ho. Those of us who've uh, recently decided to downsize our homes and possessions do know how liberating that can be. And I expect that some of you who've done that realize that as well. Traveling light is a practice that must be learned and repeated. So when we, when we downsized, we put all these valuable things on the table. And during the first day or so, I thought, how can we let these things go? By the end of the week, I thought, we got to get rid of this stuff so we can use our table again. It was amazing. So generosity to others was a sign for both Christians and Jewish people, not only of meeting shared communal responsibilities, but of liberating themselves. Well, I'm not preaching against proper self-care or having what's sufficient to relax and enjoy life. I am saying that where our treasure is, there is our heart also. Sometimes that's positive, sometimes it's negative. There are other things besides money. We can covet recognition, status, reputation, power. Each of those can be destructive of self and community. Jesus advises us to make purses that do not wear out and I think, you know, this didn't, under, I didn't get this at first, but apparently everybody did have a money purse during Jesus' life. Make purses that do not wear out so that you're not always digging into it. Seek treasures that no thief can steal and no moth destroy. Relax, Jesus is saying. Don't be so preoccupied with getting that you miss what God is giving. Now, the real key to this passage is in that first verse. There's a promise there for you and me. God desires to give us the kingdom and calls us into it. He doesn't say, if God desires to give us the kingdom and calls us into it. 
Jesus nurtures trust by announcing that. Like a parent who only wants good things for their kids, so also it's God's good pleasure to give us the kingdom. This promise creates in us a shared expectation about the future. This promise produces a communion among us. It fosters hope. All of Jesus' instructions about our life together, whether about prayer, money, watchfulness, care of neighbor, whatever, are anchored precisely in this gospel promise. It is God's good pleasure to give us the kingdom. Remembering and reminding each other of this promise enables us to trust. Okay, a little thought experiment here. You know, when we hear that phrase, sell your possessions and give alms, that comes across as a command. Now, if it's rooted in God's good pleasure to give us the kingdom, God's care, then that giving of alms and possessions comes across rather differently, I think. It says God is going to give us the kingdom. When it's rooted in our trust that God yearns to give us everything we want, then our lives are a little different. We're no longer driven by fear. We may be actually able to imagine treasures beyond false forms of security. Many of you recognize family and friends as terribly valuable treasures. They are anchored also in that care that God gives us. Treasure is heavenly, no doubt, but it's also very earthly. It's the stuff constitutive of this new heaven and earth. I'm tempted to compare this to the good soil in Jesus' parable, if you remember that. So our trust in God, our care, is the good soil in which this sower sows seeds. And the good, shit, the good soil gives growth to good product. And I think that's true of our lives as well. And those good products are happiness, peace, serenity. So who's truly worthy of our trust? What should we treasure? I invite you to sit with that question. What should we treasure? Bring it to prayer. Listen for God's answer. Let us pray. Almighty God, we're close to the central message of your faith that we are not to be afraid, that we are in your hands that nothing we can do will cause us to abandon you or us. Help us, we pray, to locate our treasure only on you. For we pray in Christ's name, amen. God has given us much. We return a portion of what God's given us in our morning offering.
Almighty God, give us the wisdom to know how to serve you and the courage to do it. For we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Jumps the time for morning prayer and I'm going to ask you what your concerns are or what reports you have about people that we've prayed for already. I have a couple of things, Shannon. First okay. of all, we all know about Karen, our miss. She's suffering with the COVID and other things and really sick and just pray for her to recover from this. And on a personal note, um, I went to the dermatologist, what was that, a week before last? Mm -hmm. And he found a basal cancer cell on my arm up here. I'm going to have surgery on it later on to have that cut off. I'm not too concerned about it. It's, from what the dermatologist said, it's one of the things that they can they fix easily. So, but that's the thing. On an also personal note, uh, I can relate to what you were talking about in the sermon today, but we've been fixing things at the condo and getting rid of a lot of stuff. And, and I, so I can relate to that very much. And okay. I am thankful for this lady here helping me overcome this time in my life. <laughs> Pray for me. <laughs> <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Shannon, also my daughter Tamara is still having more diabetic issues, so mm. if we can keep her in thoughts and prayers, I appreciate that. Yes, yes. Shannon, our, our niece Amy has finished her chemotherapy, and now there are other things that she has to face, so keep praying for her. What's her name? What's Amy. her last name? Dore. Spell it. Dore, D-O-R-E, Dore, Dore. Dore. Dore, Dore. Okay. Karen. Okay. <coughs> Had to be pretty alert to know it was going to be open, I suspect. Last call. Let's pray. Thank you for your concerns. We are amazed, dear God. You are so far beyond us that you're not attempted to abandon us even when we abandon you. That's hard to imagine. Your love is not based on our behavior or even our faith. Indeed, your grace overflows. How can we understand that? We do get glimpses of that when others act graciously to us. We know that you are trustworthy, that your care for us is steadfast. Teach us to trust in you and not in other things. When we have such a foundation, our lives are full of praise and gratitude. We find that our gratitude leads us to care for others, for our planet, your creation. We pray for those who are experiencing pain and illness. We think particularly of 
Karen Yuga, Tamara, Albert Beatty, Amy Dory. For those who have cancer cells that they are going, Brian in particular, who's going for surgery. We also thank you for when we are liberated from stuff. Be with those who make decisions that affect the lives of others. Our county commissioners, our government, governor, our president, our Congress, give them wisdom, dear God. Give them a right sense of priorities. We ask for ourselves a greater measure of faith, a generous spirit, and compassionate hearts. Guide us in our daily lives that they may reflect our trust in you. Be with Palmetto Presbyterian Church as we make decisions. Be with the thrift store, particularly on Saturday mornings and afternoons. Help us to be more and more the true body of Christ. For we pray this in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For that is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 581, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. Oh. Uh -huh.
Now let us say the benediction for each other. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Jesus Christ, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Believe this and go in the joy of God's power and love and grace.